That happens every now and then. <laughs> I apologize. Oh, please take your Bibles now and turn with me, if you will, back to that passage that we were reading a few minutes ago over in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 15. As you know, we are looking at the ten times that the Jews rebelled against God in their wilderness wanderings. We're nearing the completion of rebellion test number four, which was the test at Rephidim, which was actually a replay of test number two, because both of those tests involve walking by faith for water. As you know from our past studies, Rephidim is where Amalek attacked Israel, and God declared that he would have a perpetual war with Rephidim and with Amalek from generation to generation. We talked about the connection between prayer and spiritual warfare. Prayer is essential for the believer who is engaged in spiritual warfare, and you are engaged in warfare, whether you like it or not. Just like God's war with Amalek, which is from generation to generation, even so spiritual warfare against Satan and his demons is likewise from generation to generation. Central to all of that, of course, for the believer, is the work of the Holy Spirit. We did a whole series on how the Bible makes it clear that the Holy Spirit is intimately connected to prayer and spiritual warfare, and that's significant because Rephidim is about warfare and prayer. I'll give you a quick review. There are nine points. We learn multiple principles of prayer from Rephidim, and that event gives a physical illustration of the exhortation by the Apostle Paul regarding the spiritual warfare in Ephesians chapter 6. What we learned in Exodus 17 was one, in spiritual warfare, Satan, the enemy, will attack you no matter what you're doing, but he always will attack you when you're walking by faith and doing the will of God. Number two, as in most warfare, there is a division of assignments. There's a selection of troops, those who are sent as frontline warriors, there's a chain of command, and there is logistical support. Number three, every subordinate officer must fulfill his role if there is to be a victory. So there's a chain of command, and you have to do what you're supposed to do at that level. Number four, headquarters must always be kept apprised of what's going on on the battlefield, and for us, that's our communication with God through prayer. Number five, there are always definite and doable steps in securing a victory. That's the whole point of military planning. If you leave anything out, you are guaranteed defeat, and God has already laid out the battle plan for us in the Word of God. If you do it his way, you win. If you don't do it his way, you lose. You cannot, this is point number six, you cannot make up your own rules for spiritual warfare. Without prayer, there is, with prayer, excuse me, there is victory, but without prayer, there is defeat. Number seven, and we saw this with Moses when he finally had to sit down on a big rock and Aaron and Hur held up his hands on both sides. The principle we learned there is leaders get tired too, because every time his hands went down, Israel lost. Every time his hands were up, Israel won. Number eight, nobody is exempt from the spiritual warfare faced by this church. If you're part of this church, you're part of this army, you're part of this platoon, we're down to about a platoon at this point, <laughs> we have to do what God called us to do. It's a battle you cannot give up or the enemy will kill you. Number nine, Joshua got credit for the victory, but it was actually a team effort, as we saw before. Now, last time in Exodus, we compared some of the key points in Ephesians 6 that are illustrated in Exodus 17. Ephesians 6 is the Christian's guide to spiritual warfare based on prayer. We ended last time by reminding ourselves that at the death of Moses, another very strange battle took place as well. And that was Michael the archangel contending with the devil. And Jude, who wrote the book of Jude, is a spiritual warrior in his own right. Jude is known as the warrior against apostasy. And we saw that amazing declaration in the middle of that military warning about spiritual spies concerning the character of the apostates. That was warning concerning how we should approach spiritual warfare. And as it's clear there and elsewhere in the New Testament, 
Prayer is one of the key weapons that God has given to us in that war. And as Michael himself proves, don't fall into the charismatic trap of trying to rebuke demons. Even Michael didn't do that. So we looked at Ephesians 6 in spiritual warfare. We learned from verse 10 two things. He says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Number one, we learned that the armor and prayer, which is what this chapter is all about, are indispensable in spiritual warfare. Number two, we learned that the strength is not our own, but his power and might, that which is provided by the Spirit of God. And then it talks about the whole armor of God in verse 11, and we can't ignore any part of that armor. That means that you not only have to have the armor on for yourself, but you also have to be involved in defending other soldiers as well through prayer. Soldiers do not fight their wars alone. They fight armies. There are at least two armies in every conflict. Sometimes there are more than two, but at least two to have a conflict. Neither the soldiers nor we are freewheeling independent agents doing our own thing. This section of Ephesians 6 is addressed to my brethren. That's a group specifically the church at, uh, at Ephesus. And so when he's talking about prayer, he's talking about corporate prayer, not just individual prayer. Number two, although each soldier will face specific soldiers from the enemy side in hand-to-hand -hand combat, they must fight side by side so that they are not overwhelmed by multiple foes coming at them from multiple different directions. Number three, when soldiers fight, they're at the same location at the same time. That's the point of the church gathered for prayer, as we do at prayer meeting. Number five, there are at least three guaranteed serious consequences for the kind of soldier who refuses to come to the battle or who is always late for the battle, in this case, for corporate prayer. Number one, he puts his fellow soldiers at risk of death, thus risking the safety and defeat of the larger unit. Number two, he puts himself at risk of death because he is a highly visible open target as he moves across the battlefield alone and he doesn't have anybody else covering his back if he gets attacked by multiple enemy soldiers. And three, he puts himself in serious jeopardy with his commander-in-chief because he is willfully refusing to follow orders. The enemy may be unlawful, but the commander-in-chief has the lawful authority to put the miscreant soldier to death if his negligence, sloth, and personal comfort jeopardize or cause the death of fellow soldiers. So the application that we gave you last week, Knowing theology is irrelevant unless there is personal application. The church is not here for our personal pleasure when it's convenient to come. The church is here for our protection, and God put you here to protect the other soldiers in this church. And that's why you heard me preach so strongly on why you need to be here for prayer meeting. Verse 12 talks about wrestling against flesh and blood, and we're not doing that. We're wrestling against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. We talked about wrestling, and I gave you an illustration of how I used to wrestle, and I made it all the way to the Ivy League championships and lost the final match by one point. The devil can kill you. You can't kill him. That's why wrestling is used as an illustration. But all he has to do, even if he can't kill you, is beat you by one point. You're not wrestling against human flesh and blood, although the devil will use other human beings to attack you, as quite obviously he does. But the real opponent is invisible. Your real opponent is not just one demon. Paul uses four words in this context. He says against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Those are military terms. In fact, they are military terms that deal with a hierarchy within the military, whether a hierarchy in the Navy or a hierarchy in the Army or the Marines or the Air Force, and they have different terms. There are no admirals, for example, uh, in the Army. But they are terms that relate to levels of authority in a military structure. And Paul tells you the devil has a military structure because it is a war. It is a fight. It is a battle. Those terms are used throughout Scripture dealing with the great rebellion that Satan brought against God and which he has continued to instigate throughout all of human history. 
The devil and his demons are not a bunch of independent neighborhood thugs and hoodlums. They have a military plan. They have a specific strategy. They have resources and organizational skills. They do not work independently. They work together to accomplish a common goal, which is the defeat of every Christian on planet Earth, and thus the defeat of God's work on Earth, because God has ordained that he will use people to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth to other people. So the devil's goal is to stop the spread of the gospel, and if he can, he's going to kill the messengers who carry it. So we began our study by looking at the first word, which is principalities, arche, the first ones. That's used by Paul concerning angels and demons who are invested with power. And he talks about nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. The first place we see this is where we have a word of encouragement because even though you've got the top echelon of Satan's forces on the attack and focused on you, God gives you a very important protection, and that is a guarantee of your salvation. Over in Romans chapter 8, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. The devil's going to kill you if he can. He's doing that to Christians all over the world. We just read about a persecuted brother over in Turkey earlier. We're going to be seeing part of that on Wednesday evening, where you'll see video footage of these kinds of things actually going on, and people who have escaped from it, and talking about what happened, and seeing it happening in Great Britain, and in France, and in Germany today. You need to be here Wednesday evening. You are in a war, whether you like it or not, and it's coming to a street near you. Hope to see you Wednesday. Because you are going to face this. But you have a guarantee. Verse 37. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Now look at verse 38. Here's our key verse. Because Paul's going to use the same word that he talked about wrestling against principalities. Here it is. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities... And now the next word is the next word he also uses over there in Ephesians 6. But here he's got it in Romans chapter 8, and he's saying, These kings cannot separate you from the love of God, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The devil would love to cut you off from God. But God is faithful. Will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able to but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. That way of escape may be death, but there's always a way of escape if we keep our faith in him. Jesus told us in John chapter 10, My Father which gave them is greater than all, and no man can pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Nobody can pluck you out of the hand of Jesus. Nobody can pluck you out of the hand of the Father. There is a sovereign God who is in control of everything that ever happens in the universe. And he has promised here in Romans chapter 8, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Nothing can separate you from the love of God, including Satan's highest echelon of demons. You're safe in his hand. Think about it this way. Pretend that you're a marble. All of you remember marbles. You know, I don't see any kids playing marbles anymore. I see them using their thumbs instead of flipping marbles. I see them banging on little devices and walking across streets, you know, with cars swerving around them every which way, and they have totally oblivious to it. But we used to play marbles. You shoot a marble, and a lot of had fun when I was a kid. But pretend you're a marble, and you're in the hand of Jesus. And then God puts his hand on top. Can anybody pry loose the hand of the Father and then reach in it, fill back the fingers of the Son and get the marble? Can they? Not Satan himself. You're safe in Jesus. So no matter what foe you face in the spiritual war, 
you are safe. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's the worst they can do. And from the to glory. Joshua gave a command to his troops as they entered the promised land. Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Joshua 1 9. Paul tells us with great encouragement God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The first time we look here in Romans chapter 8 when we're contemplating that echelon of demonic forces that Satan has thrust against us is a word of encouragement. Nothing can separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can pluck you out of his hand. Nothing can pluck you out of the Father's hand. Be at peace. The struggle may seem horrendous. Be at peace. Death may seem looming on the horizon. Be at peace. You may be seeming to lose everything in this earth. Be at peace. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Yes, it's a spiritual battle, but you have a comprehensive armor. You have everything that is needed for defense. You have the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the girdle of truth, the feet shod of the preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith wherewith you can be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And you have one offensive weapon, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Read Matthew 4 sometime. Every time Satan tested Jesus Christ, Christ quoted scripture. He defeated the devil with words that were already written 1,400 years before by Moses. That's the weapon God has given you to drive back and drive away the enemy. The principalities, the powers, the rulers, the spiritual wickedness. He's given you a weapon so if you don't know the word of God, you may be able to defend yourself just by placing that shield on top of you and cowering in a hole somewhere, but you'll never drive back the enemy. This is the only thing that drives back the enemy. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You need to learn it. You need to love it. You need to meditate on it. You need to memorize it. You need to day by day, and I've given you many illustrations of how in other places where the Lord has allowed me to minister Everybody in the church, from the oldest to the youngest who could talk, <laughs> was memorizing scripture every week and standing up entire, in front of the entire church, quoting it. Can you imagine if everybody here in this church, I don't know how many are here today, but if we had you all prayed up here and have to quote one verse, word perfect. Could you do even one verse? Probably, and, and you couldn't quote somebody, something that somebody else had quoted. Everybody's thinking, John 3.16, I can get that one. <laughs> Suppose the first person said John 3.16. Can you come up with a second one? Think of maybe the first row here coming up one by one and quoting just one verse. And as it moves back, you think, oh, they knocked off another one that I know. Oh, they knocked, I only had three verses. What am I going to do now? Could you do it? We used to do that every Sunday evening. Every Sunday evening at Blessed Hope Bible Church with as many people as we have here 
and even people in their 80s were standing up quoting Bible verses, sometimes extended passages every week. Sometimes someone would stand up and quote an entire chapter or two chapters of the Bible that they'd memorized in one week. You know what? They were learning how to use the sword. Do you know how to use your swords? Spiritual warfare requires that the soldiers be armed, not merely sit in concrete bunkers as the enemy throws in a nuclear attack. It requires that we be armed. And folks, the battle is intensifying. As we sit with our devices twiddling our thumbs, tuned out to what's happening in the world around us. 1 Corinthians 15, we just passed over that briefly last week, so I'll go over it again briefly. Beginning in verse 22, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. You know this passage, this is the resurrection passage. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and he's risen already. Afterward, they that are Christ that is coming. So we have a break between first fruits and the harvest, the end of the harvest. First fruits was one of Israel's feasts. Christ fulfills the typology of all the feasts. We've talked about that in the past. Now, he then jumps us all the way from the first fruits all the way down to the end. Verse 24. Then cometh the end, when ye shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when ye shall have put down all... Ah, here is our word principality, but it's translated with the English word rule. Put down all arche, all of those highest echelons of authority which were standing against him. Jesus, in the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power. We're going to see those other two words later on here in Paul's passage in Ephesians chapter 6. For he, that is Jesus, must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Right now, the great spiritual war has been going on for thousands of years. Ever since the Garden of Eden, all the way through the Old Testament, all the way through the Gospels, all the way through the Epistles, into the Church Age, all the way through the Church Age, down to the present day, new soldiers have come on the battlefield, and Satan's done his best to kill them. He and his demons don't die, and they keep learning from generation to generation new tactics that they can use against believers. Somebody has success here, they get together and they figure out what are we going to do about that kind of a person when they show up the next time. You don't have that ability. You can study church history, you can see what has happened, you can see how to stand against certain political moves and so on, but that's not where you go. The where you go is the Bible, your sword to know how to defeat the enemy because every answer is here. Satan's only a creature. He has to make it up as he goes along. But the Word of God, the written Word, is comparable to the living Word. Both are perfect. Both make no mistakes. Both don't have to change. There is no change in Christ or in the Word of God. So you can go here and you can find the answer for every type of attack that he will ever bring against you. That should be great encouragement, great hope, because he's going to win in the end. He must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, that is God the Father, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, that is unto Christ, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that is the Father, that God may be all in all. There's a guarantee in the resurrection chapter 
1 Corinthians chapter 15 that Jesus is, in fact, the victor. And we're going to tell you, even though you're facing death right now, even though you're going to bury loved ones, and I've buried many, the day's coming when Jesus is going to conquer death. That's the last enemy. And there's some other enemies that are going to get smushed before he conquers death and puts that down. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. But he's going to put all rule, all RK, all principalities and all powers and all rulers and all darkness, he's going to put it all down. And he'll crush death. And there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more tears. Dear Christian, do you believe that? Do you believe that? Let me ask it again. Do you believe that? If you do, it will change the way you live. You will not be afraid to witness. You will not be afraid of temporal consequences. You will not be afraid of what men can do unto you. Because the Lord is your helper. And he is your commander in chief. And he has given to you a commission as a soldier to penetrate the enemy lines, not to hide out in the bunkhouse. Dear people, this is serious business. Israel is illustrating for us through those wilderness wanderings and through the ten times of temptation that they didn't really believe God and they proved it by the way in which they acted. The question for us is, if we believe God, and right now we're talking about spiritual warfare, if we believe God in the issue of spiritual warfare, which is Rephidim, if we believe God, it will change the way that we act, the way that we live, the way that we interact, the way that we witness, the way that we pray, the way that we go forth to tell others that Jesus died for them. And the enemy will try to kill you when you do that. Believe it. Praise God that we live in this country where we still have the opportunity to do that. It's like someone once said, there are no countries that are closed to missions, just countries that it's more difficult to witness the second time. You have the opportunity today and tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday and all the rest of this week. You will come in contact with somebody who does not know Christ. What are you going to do when the opportunity arises? I know we don't like to get challenged like that, do we? Ephesians chapter 1, we see it used again. And again, we see the superiority, the supremacy of our Lord Jesus Christ against all of these echelons of spiritual darkness. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Now let's stop right there for just a second. You're going to have to have wisdom if you enter the spiritual warfare. You can't walk around with the Looney Tunes, you know, playing in your head through a bunch of earphones. You, you've got to have wisdom. Say, man, I, I don't know very much. I don't think I can have wisdom. Listen, the Bible says, if any lack wisdom, James 1.17, if any lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is as a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Now listen to the next verse. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. God has promised wisdom, and all you have to do is ask for it. But you have to ask in faith. In other words, oh Lord, give me wisdom. Well, I didn't really think he was going to give it to me anyway. That's not the way that you ask for it. 
You ask for it, Lord, I'm faced with this circumstance. I don't know how in the world I'm going to deal with it. Please give me wisdom. God will tap you on the shoulder and say, not literally, do not take me for a charismatic. I am not a charismatic. <laughs> but he'll tap you so, figuratively on the shoulder and say, you know, I've got an answer to that in the Bible. Why don't you try looking up a key word in your Strong's Exhaustive Concordance? See what I said about that. And of course, if you have it memorized, he can bring it to mind just like that. I've had that happen many times. Lord, I don't know what to do. Please give me wisdom. And you know what? God brings back to my memory something I memorized perhaps as a child. And I say, yeah, yeah, I don't remember it exactly, but I know that verse is in there. And I get my Strong's out and I look it up and sure enough, not just the verse, but the whole passage is dealing with that issue. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth liberally and upbraideth not. God will never bawl you out for asking for wisdom. Say, oh, I don't want to do that. Maybe he'll get mad at me. I should have known. No, he'll give it to you. He never bowls you out for asking for wisdom. It says so in the scripture. That's in this context. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. There's your encouragement. And what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Boy, there's the goal. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who to believe, according to the working of his mighty power? That's not us, it's his power. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him in his own right hand in heavenly places. Now look at verse 21. I've just given you the context. Here's Christ seated in the heavenlies. Here's all the stuff he's done for us. Here's what God has given to you. And now he says, he's put him where? Verse 21. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but that which is to come. And has put all things under his feet and gave him be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. He tells you this incredible background and why we have hope and why we have security and why we have guarantees and why we have promises and why we have inheritance because we're in Christ and he is over all of that stuff that's trying to fight against him. Far above, not just he squeaked it out but he managed to get on top but who knows they might flip him over. That's not what it says. Far above all principality, all arche, and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, including Lucifer, including Satanos, Satan, including Diabolos, devil, for every name. That is your commander in chief. That is your Lord. That is the God who loved you and came to earth and died for your sins and was buried and rose again. He loved you enough to take the bullet for you. Do you scorn him and walk away from the bleeding body and say, huh, that jerk got it for me. But I'm, I'm doing my thing now. That's the way a lot of Christians live. That's the way all the pagans live. Dear ones, Jesus shall reign where'er the sun doth his successive journeys run. His kingdom spread from shore to shore till moons shall wax and wane no more. How has it changed your life? You have these precious promises. He's given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, Peter says. And those promises are designed to motivate us to holy living, to confident living, to peaceful living, to productive living, 
to living that is unashamed of Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful passage. Yes, Ephesians chapter 3 also tells us the same thing. This will have to be our last one for today. There are many more, but I'm giving you just some illustrations of how Jesus beats the devil's army. And that's why when you're connected to him by prayer and you're in his earthly army, you can win too. Ephesians 3.10. We'll start in verse 6. For the Gentiles, he's been talking about the mystery, uh, how God has broken down the middle wall of partition as he talks about in Galatians also. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given. That I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now listen to verses 9 and 10. And to make all men see. Paul says, why am I preaching? I want you to understand this. I want you to see this. I want you to see what is the fellowship of the mystery. He's talked about the mystery back in verse, first four verses of Ephesians chapter 3. The mystery is, is something that was not revealed in the Old Testament as it's now revealed unto the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. It's not something that's spooky. It's something that God didn't reveal in the Old Testament and he has now revealed in the, the New Testament. He says, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Takes you back to John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, the same as in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Who? By the Word. Without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was light, and the life was the light of men, and so on. Down in verse 14. And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory has of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It's talking about Jesus Paul's talking about Jesus here in the same place. Who created all things by Jesus Christ. Who's the creator in Genesis 1? Jesus Christ. Now, verse 10. To the intent that now, unto the principalities, there's our word, R-K, unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. Did you know that God is teaching the spirit armies because there's the good armies and the bad army. He's teaching them his wisdom by you. That's a scary proposition. <laughs> they're watching. I believe they're angelic beings here watching us. I believe they're demonic beings watching us. They're looking for you to have... Uh, Wrong thoughts, wrong words, wrong attitudes, wrong actions, wrong motives. Five different areas that the believer has to watch out for. And then they're going to attack you where you've got your guard down. They want to know what you heard today. They want to know how you're going to respond with it. Whether or not it's going to make a change in your life based on the word of God. Paul says here to the intent. Why did God do it? What was his intention? What was God's intention? in doing what Paul has just talked about here in the first few verses. God's intention was that now, unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. That boggles the mind, folks. That God would use the church to show his many-faceted wisdom according, and here as he explains it, otherwise we'd be left hanging, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ah, it goes back to his ultimate purpose of putting us in Christ, which is what Ephesians chapter 1 is all about, in Christ, in him, in the beloved. That's chapter 1 in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by faith of him. The angels and the demons are watching as we walk by faith and say that's astounding that God would be able to accomplish his purpose with those funny, weak, little, pudgy, fleshy things called people. 
in whom, that is in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence. You don't have to be scared. By faith of him, wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. We say, man, Paul spoke out and he, he really got beat up. <laughs> I'm afraid that if I speak out, I might get beat up too. The devil might have somebody do something nasty to me. I don't want that to happen. It's the way most of us respond. That is not the way we're supposed to respond. Paul says, don't you realize God's teaching wisdom, even to the angelic sphere, by the way in which he's dealing with you in your life? Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause, in other words, it just boggles my mind, says Paul. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. You're part of a family. I have a challenge for you. Before next week, here's an assignment. Find out how many times, and in what locations, that is what context, how many times the word family is mentioned in the epistles. And I get them all, get all the epistles. Start with the book of Acts and go all the way through the epistles, all the way to the book of Revelation. Next week, I'm going to ask you the question, how many times does the word family show up? It's very important. We all talk about families. We're all in families, husbands, wives, children. Talk about Christian families. Talk about pagan families. Families are what compose our society. Families are the structure God made here on earth. I want you to find out how many times. Okay, that's the challenge. Our time is up. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your word and for its power. It's exciting to see how you are sovereignly in control of all that is. You are the commander-in-chief who has guaranteed victory in the war, but you bring us, who are your children, whom you are developing into soldiers for spiritual warfare, you bring us through the war so that we might learn to trust you and to believe your word that what you've given us is adequate for every conflict that we'll face in life and that we can be at peace because nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, including all the echelons of the demonic forces. They'll fight us, they'll try to kill us, but that's the worst they can do because it ushers us immediately into your presence. And they've tried for centuries, for millennia, to kill believers and to squelch the word of God so that no one will hear it. But they will never win because Jesus is far above all principality and powers and rulers. He is the victor. He is the Lord. And someday at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and every tongue shall give thanks and praise and honor and glory to Jesus Christ to the glory of God the Father Father thank you for by calling us enabling us empowering us placing us in this generation you have given us opportunity for service and we thank you in Jesus name Amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number...